Welcome to the Diffuse Podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the Diffuse Podcast. Welcome to 2024, and this is our first episode in 2024. And I think it's right and proper that because it's our first one, we should start with someone pretty impressive and very um, special. He's actually a good friend of mine, Guy Batchelor. Now, Guy is the CEO and founder of Minerva Elite, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. In his own words, modest as he is, he's a leader, a motivator, and an open water swimmer. Guy, good afternoon, good evening. How are you? Good evening, Philip. I'm very well, well, thanks. Lovely to be on the podcast with you. Good, 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 good. And a happy new year. Happy new year to you. So, come on then, I've, you know, how would you introduce yourself? Uh, I mean, I, I probably don't introduce myself with my LinkedIn profile line. So, um, I, I I usually just say uh, I'm, a, I'm a business leader, uh, entrepreneur I use a little bit. Um, but yeah, you know, I... I like to think of myself as as that a business leader and a and a motivator of people around me. So, so how long has Minerva Elite been going for? So we are now in our eighth year of delivery. So we um, were formed in twenty fifteen, uh, started working from there, uh, and really we we've, we've built our portfolio of clients from then. So we're we're eight years into the journey. So we're going to go back a bit before eight years because you obviously had a um, hugely impressive career in the military. Started in the engineers, Royal Engineers, as a sapper. And then you one of one of the very few people that actually passes the SAS selection course. And then you, I was, yeah. And then I, you, I was very, very privileged. You were privileged, and, but, you know, you have to earn it. No one gives it to you, do they? So although it's a privilege, it's something you – you know, you earn with blood, sweat and tears. But you spent 18 years then, 18 years in the SAS. I did. So my my um, my um knowledge, small as it is, of, of, of that organisation and other similar organisations is, you know, very few people actually get in and qualify and, and, and become a member of those organisations. Even fewer end up staying for 18 years or, or you know, very few stay, probably five years, 10 years, but 18 years, go up through the ranks and, and achieve a huge amount. So, you know, I guess my first question is really, is you know, what does it take to do that? What does it take mentally to, and physically, I suppose, to maintain that level of excellence? Because we're not talking about working in the business. We're talking about working at the very front end, the tip of the spear of places where if you don't perform at the right level, you've a good chance of getting seriously injured or killed. So how, how do you maintain that level of performance for 18 years? So I think there's a couple of things we can talk about here, which, you know, are the basis of, of how people have, have a career in, in organisations like that or high performance teams. And that, that's the way sometimes I, I think about it is, as that sort of high performance team. So the, the first thing, um, you know, what makes the, the regiment special is, is how it selects its people. And it, it doesn't select people for um, their ability potentially as soldiers. It, it selects people for their ability to, to work in small teams. Uh, and that is, that's really key because within that you get people who are self-resilient um self-starters probably are are slightly right of the completely humble but are, are but are left of arrogant so they're, they're sort of in that swim lane where um adaptability relationship building um and and the ability to empower people to do something that they want them to do become um key parts of their of their setup so you know, it's um, 
it's quite a psychological approach that the unit takes in 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 quite a robust selection process to to make sure they've got the right people. The second part of it, I think, is the regiment has a saying about um, the basics done well, and we say it about everything, so we don't overcomplicate anything. So you know, you're in the army yourself, you know about the term "kiss," so just keep it simple, stupid, um, and that's what we do. We we keep everything at a level where it's uncomplicated and we do it and we do it to the best of our ability. So um, that sort of doing the basics well is absolutely important. And, and I think when you hear about, um, so one of my my favourite people is Admiral McRaven. He's a, a former SEAL team commander and he does a talk at the commencement speech um, at, at the University of Texas. And he talks about making your bed in the morning. And he talks about simple acts that you can do during your day that are a win for you, but also a win for your organisation. And that's what, he, that's what he's talking about. And then the third thing I think is really um, important, and it's the thing that um, allows longevity, I think, in the unit, is everyone knows our, our motto, which is who dares wins. Brilliant. And it's, you know, it's a household um <laughs> yeah, and owned by all, uh, especially if you're Del Trotter. But the the best thing about the regiment, I feel, is is its ethos, which is the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. Which is, it doesn't mean that we're the best at everything we do, but it means that we always try our best. And uh, and and I think that's that's a key part of of the unit. Is you know we're actually not overachievers. We're not all these. I think um, people get lost in this um, myth that we're all six foot five, built like Garth, can do all these amazing things. You know, can walk on water and fly like Superman. But but actually, we're not. We're we're normal people who have just got the ability to do their best. You know, if a task is worth doing, it is worth doing to the best of their ability. Um, Self discipline, I think, is the the standard. You know, yeah, everyone understands what self discipline means, but but you know, again, we we empower people to be self disciplined. So you know, when we turn around to people and we say, uh, I don't know, you know, you've got to keep your level of fitness at at this level, uh, they do it. They don't need to be pushed to do it because that's what self discipline is. Mm. Um, you asked about uh, you know what what enables people to have long careers, and I think that humility and humour piece is. Is the key, is one of the key parts to it? Um, you know, we're not. There's not a lot of arrogance in and around camp because it, there's just no place for it. And you know, when you've got a lot of alphas, which I suppose is how we would describe ourselves all together, then actually, you know, that that can be really disruptive. But as part of this high performance team, we're all pretty humble about our abilities, and and we we try and do everything with a you know, a little bit of humour involved in it. So, you know, and I, I think that's, that's generally from the services as well, isn't it? But, um, you know, really, really important in the unit because it's about when the chips are down, that there is always that moment where we can have a little smile with each other, we can crack a joke. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some humorous things that have happened to me over the years that where I think, well, if we hadn't had that ability to be able to laugh with each other, mm. we just wouldn't have got through that. Um, and and then lastly, I think, you know, that classist society where everyone's opinion is listened to and you get the ability to pass your opinion on and and shape the decisions that are made by the senior commanders, I think is 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 absolutely unique in, in any unit in the military. Now, it's sometimes misunderstood, and it's not that it's rankless. It's not that we are all just debating for the for debating's sake, but when you're a small team and you're about to do something that is potentially quite complicated, has got strategic effect, and could be somewhere where you're at distance from any form of support, then everyone's view around the table is important because sometimes the youngest and most inexperienced can see the wood for the trees and can say, 
well, why don't we try this or why don't we try that? And and I think that's what the unit as a whole is absolutely great at is about harnessing that ability for people to be able to in safety put their views out there have it talked about and if it's a good idea it gets taken on board and from a command point of view the commanders don't feel like their authority is being questioned they take it in in the way it is given and not as an approach to authority and and i think it's one of the few places probably in any military around the world where where that is not only allowed but but actively encouraged so if you combine all that stuff and 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 lastly and this this is playing to my to my inner egoist but i'm going to say it um you know there there's something very powerful about being part of a a world renowned organization and for me personally at the age of 23 when i when i first put that unit identity on myself um, to the moment I left, you know, I, I it was just a huge sense of warmth every time I walked in there to think, you know, I'm part of this, a small part of it, but you know, I, I absolutely love it. And and I think when I left, that loss of identity for me was one of the biggest things about leaving the military mm-hmm. because I, I was no longer that that person. And and I'd been in several situations where. Um, the easiest way to describe the unit, I think, is you know we're we're partly the British Army or the British forces or the British actually the, the government and the nation's problem solvers. So when there's an issue, it was once described to me as um, you know you all do the, the magic golden dust and you sprinkle a bit on the problem and the problem goes away, and that that is what the unit does. And when you walk into a room and you're all the gold dust, um, that is very empowering for the individual and and that is part of the the reason why i i probably stayed as long as i did and you know i I, you know it was a bit um it was just an awesome uh thing to be a part of almost almost like a drug Mm. um once you're in there it it just felt really good and and you know we were we were entrusted and given the responsibility for things that probably were way outside of our pay grades um but suddenly you know all your problems are going to go away and uh because these these guys from hereford are turning up and and that's a that's a wonderful thing to to be a part of so does that um does that answer your question yeah and i think i think you know my my brief experience of working alongside some of your um colleagues was that actually everyone else raises their game as well yeah, I think they because, do because the, yeah. you know, as you said, that that magic dust is spread, and you, everyone else, unconsciously, I think, just raises their game because they know, you know, here comes these guys. We're, we're going to raise our game to to not match them, but to we don't want to let ourselves down here. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and I think, you know, I, I was very lucky when I first joined the unit um, prior to nine eleven. Our, our interagency approach was was almost nil. You know, we we had a little bit of crossover with UK policing, but not not a huge amount. Um, and our our relationships with other sectors of the government were, were were very carefully firewalled. So, you know, there was no crossover. And then, you know, one of the um, offshoots of of nine eleven and the fact that you know we were now entering into a sphere of you know our history, where we, we were going to be fighting um, across you know several different regions in in a uh, proxy led, for want of a better word, war of of upstream defeat was, you know, our approach and our our interagency approach to those problems had to be much 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 tighter, and I think, um, or much more open, and and I think that was a fascinating period to be in because you know I got to see you know the the best of the other parts of of the nation and and our organisations and you know that that not only made me super proud but also I think that improved mm. us as an organisation because you know we own, we we didn't judge people against the criteria we'd been selected for we suddenly realised that actually there are other fantastic experts out there in their fields and when we pull this thing together 
suddenly we we can solve problems that we never thought we could solve. So, yeah, you know, I think we also were, were pulled up to other people's standards and, and and made better for the people that we interacted with, albeit, you know, in, off of the back of a horrendous event. Um, but all working together, I think, was a was a really great thing. And so, and so, when you, when you described earlier on about about how the you know the ethos and the kind of the sort of daily performance of individuals within the organisation, does that make leadership easier? Um, I, th- I think I think day to day, yes. It, in in a unit of you know self starters, highly motivated self-disciplined people actually leadership is is pretty straightforward um it's the more complex sides of of leadership where i think um we we not struggled but um had to find different ways of doing things so you know it was never a question about motivating sometimes it was a question of pulling people back and having to explain to them that it may have been the correct or the um you know the obvious tactical move but the strategic situation just didn't didn't um allow for us to do that so i think sometimes we felt that uh, through things outside of our control we could have got a, an outcome that was um successful but we were never allowed to get to the start line and i think that sort of controlling that that um almost disappointment from people when they can see something that's going to happen and and then they're not allowed to go in and, and intervene is is the thing for us that was was the hardest to do um i mean it was it was generally based around you know um policies and permissions or or assets that you know we thought we we should have as a as a standard and 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 we didn't because you know the nation or, or whatever just couldn't supply that sort of support so then we had to think quite carefully about how we managed our resource so we you know our, our people so they, they didn't feel that um you know their efforts were in vain so so after 18 years i mean you know anyone leaving a career in the military or policing or other sort of environments it's, it's always a difficult challenge leaving those environments leaving something like the SAS must be even more difficult the, the first you know that time when you walked out the gates for not the last time but the, probably the last time as a a serving member you know you kind of talked a bit but you, you inferred earlier about how difficult that was so how did you deal with that what what was the kind of mindset for you in terms of right I'm no longer in that what do I do now what was that mindset about for you and what did you take from I suppose that 18 years that allowed you to or enabled you to carve another elite niche into what you were going to do? So um, I, I think I'd, like everything, you know, I, I I prepared to go on selection for about two and a half years. And what I did was prepared myself to leave for about two and a half years. So I I'd sort of mentally started the process of what does it look like when I'm when I'm not a member of this unit anymore, um, and I think part of starting my own business was was that leap into okay I'm, I'm going to do this anymore, but I need something that I'm going to focus against, which I'm going to be able to drive. So my my mind isn't always thinking about well I'm now no longer guy in the in the SAS, and and I was talking yesterday to someone about this, and and actually. The one thing I never took into account was that sort of loss of identity. When I did actually leave, it was amazing how much, that, um, you know, personally, when I look back on it now, I, I had I had that sense of identity because I was in that unit, mm. and that um, surprises me because, um, as an individual, I would class myself as a as a family man, as being very. Um, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but you know, centric around my family and 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 not having a massive ego, mm. but that did that did um, 
affect me for a while. You know, I was just like, oh, you know, I'm I'm not that bloke anymore. When I walk into a room, everyone goes, oh wow, the the bloke's the bloke from Hereford's here. I, I just didn't have that anymore, and I and I did miss it. Mm. Um, and I think that running my own business has been a little part of of trying to fill that void. It's never quite the same, but you know, I do. You know, it's it's lovely when I walk into a room and, and people acknowledge me as, you know, the head of Minerva, especially interesting more people who who work for me rather than or who I work with than actually the clients because uh, I use a lot of subcontractors and and to get their respect I think is you know is really fulfilling and and, and you know I that's what I enjoy more most now about my job is is when they come up to me and they, and they thank me for coming to to work and and they say how much they enjoy work from working for Minerva and, and how much they're enjoying the task. So, you know, that's why I, I take a huge amount of pleasure from that. And so, so going into business, you know, I mean, I don't know how you did it, but you know, a lot of people sit down and they kind of think of values and all sorts of things. Did, did you go through that sort of process when you were starting Minerva? Yeah, I did. I mean, um, <laughs> I, uh, as I was coming up to, like I said to you, I thought about two years before I left about this is what I'm, I'm going to do. And I thought, well, my uh, my GCSE in woodwork isn't going to get me too far. <laughs> so what, what what do I do from an educational point of view? So I, I did a degree uh, and, and it happened that the army at the time had a program where it offered you the ability to do a master's in business administration. So, you know, not, not being overly bright, I looked at it and thought, well, if you're going to go into business, having a business degree might be a good idea. Um, and I went and did it, and and actually the uh, the organisations that um, I used, especially the university, which was the University in Northampton, I was really privileged to to meet a professor there that was running the programme who who gave us the ability to, to to be wide in our thinking. And and when I said to him about you know can I can I write a dissertation which is also a business model which is also a a plan. He was like, well, absolutely. Why wouldn't I allow you to do that? And and that was that was brilliant for me, really, because I got to commit my ideas to paper and bounce them off someone in a, in that safe environment um, who who helped me sort of uh, shape my my idea of of what the future or what Minerva might look like. And then um, you know we tweaked around a, a few of the things, and you know he would throw throw ideas back at me about you know some of my thinking was it was it too military was it going to fit into the civilian market would I be able to do what I was saying I was going to do and and that I found I found really helpful and actually when it came to the start point when you know I I was going to start this journey having that in the background and and like you know like they say you know no no plan survives contact with the enemy and mine certainly did not but what it had allowed me to do was, you know, when different things happened, I, I could do sort of second and third order effects from what the initial plan was and, and, and sort of go again and think, right, you know, that's not worked. We, we can change it here. Or, yeah. You know, we, you know, our marketing plan at the moment is just not, not good enough. We need to change that. And, and I think that that's been, that was really useful. So not only did I gain, gain a lot of sort of business knowledge, I, I could also bounce that through, you know, my plan and, and what the future looked like. And, you know, resilience is a word that comes up. Clearly, your previous career, does, you know, required huge resilience just to get through the course, let alone the selection process, let alone actually existing for, for 18 years. And so I guess resilience is part of starting a new business, isn't it? In terms of, as you said, things don't always go to plan. So you've got to get back up again and, okay, well, that didn't work. I'm going to do this. So how big a part has resilience then played in, you know, in your life, basically? Yeah, I, you know, quite a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a pr- pretty resilient chap. Um, but I think the important thing about resilience is, for me, it's changed as I've got older and as my life's changed, my my resilience has come in, in, in different ways. And I know that starts, probably sounds a bit strange, but I'll try and quantify it. It's, I think when I was 23, 24, and I, I was going on, you know, the selection process and, and doing that stuff, I had the resilience of youth and I had the exuberance of youth and the energy of youth, um, which, you know, actually when you when you look at the task, you know, there were some 
arrogance there as well to say, well, you know, are you up to this? Do you deserve to do this? Are you capable of doing this? And the answer was always yes. Mm. And as I then went went on, especially during my career, it was it was the people around me from a military point of view, but also, you know, my wife, who by that stage, you know, we we'd met, we were boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, I I used to take, you know, she she was part of the resilience program because I always knew that whatever I was doing, everything was in order at home. I didn't have to worry about any of the stuff at home because Rach had it down. And and we grew together. And then when we got to the point where we, we started the business, actually now a lot of my resilience is because we're in it together mm-hmm. and we can bounce ideas off each other. And we don't always agree. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Like any good um, husband and wife combo. But I, I think actually a lot of the time she sees it um, – she she sees the answer a lot quicker than I do, and 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 she's much better at the the skills around managing people and managing an organisation than than I am, to be frank. Because the way I was used to operate in in a unit was um, was all about alphas being alphas and doing alpha type work. Where you know we've now got a, a different blend of personalities, people. Um, and she's much, much better at, at the uh, management and leadership of that. Um, and we found, you know, balance in our business and, and roles. So um, it's gone from being my own resilience that pulled me through to like a group resilience and now almost like a, a partnership resilience where um, I don't I don't feel like the weight of the weight of it all is on my shoulders yeah. so yeah you know i think um you know physical resilience i i can talk about until i'm blue in the face mm-hmm. but i think that sort of mental resilience which is the more interesting one mm. is about not just about you and your mindset but about the p- people that you surround yourself with and you know there's i think there's a saying i heard once that if you want to be a million you know if you hang around with five people, four of them are millionaires, you'll be the fifth. I think it might even be you that said that to me. <laughs> but when you unpick that, when you unpick that statement, it's about surround yourself with good people and you know, good things will happen to you. And and I think that's um that's really important from a mental resilience point of view. You know, you can't you can't do this stuff on your own. Um very few people are have got the ability or or the um talent. Uh, you know, if they're normal to to be able to run businesses and, and do, you know, a really impressive activity, it is always about a team effort. And and talking of team effort, then, I mean, you know, how 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 challenging is it then? And it may not be challenging, but how challenging or is there a challenge when you've when you've had your background and you're now working in an environment where um, you've got very different personalities? but there's a common task in terms of here's an objective you've got to achieve in terms of um, a task that you've been asked to do. Pe- people in the civilian world obviously live very different lives. They have very different values and very different ways of operating. Did did that, was that difficult at first? Is, is it got easier or was, or was it always quite a simple process of, of doing what, you know, the, the, the task that you were set out to do within Minerva? I think that's, it's been a a journey of discovery in in a lot of ways, and I think yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of Minerva. I'm very proud of our reputation, and you know, you said some nice things about us earlier, which is, is lovely to hear. And I think we've adopted the do the basics well methodology that I learned in the, in the unit, and we've applied that to the civilian market, and and actually. You know, we don't ask, I was going to say we don't ask a lot then. We ask a huge amount of the people who work for us and we we apply standards that are within our ethos and, and we would prefer to have a conversation with someone if they're, if they're not willing to do a pipe by our, our, our self-discipline and our our rules for working, then we would prefer not to work with you. And, and we're, we're really quite open about that. Mm. But generally everyone who works with us and, and what I've been really um, yeah it's been a pleasure to see within the UK security industry because I, I know people can can dig it down a lot but actually the, the people I've met since I've been in the sector I've met some really 
awesome professionals who are diligent, good at their jobs, highly educated, very knowledgeable, and have got a lot of experience. And actually, I feel really privileged that, you know, week in, week out, year in, year out, they will come and work on our tasks and they give of their best. And and some of them, when you ask them about their backgrounds, it's truly humbling what, what they've done and the positions they've been in. And then suddenly, they're you know, they're working for you. And I think sometimes, you know, the, the, it, it takes a lot of my my pleasure is, is when I'm telling the client, you know, exactly some of the people he's got working for him, doing what um, sometimes I think they feel security is just that, oh, it's the bottom of the list and, you know, I'm, I'm not really that interested and there's there's no tangible effect from it. But, but actually, you know, if it went wrong, you have got people around you that can make that problem way less than it's going to be mm. and, you know, a thank you every now and again is is no bad thing, um, and I've gone a bit off track. Sorry, sorry, uh, but you know, but the answer to to that question is, you know, all those people are have got standards. They've got high standards. So, so actually, when I'm pulling them into the, this Minerva task, it's that part of it has has been quite easy for me because, you know, I, I do think the UK security sector has got you know, has got some really good people in it um, that, that I'm just lucky enough to, to be able to use. And and when I'm I'm talking about it from a sort of client perspective, I, I apply the same rules that um, I used when I was in the military, which was be truthful. You know, I, I tell people what they need, not necessarily what I think they want or I would like them to have. I give them options. Uh, I tell them what the second and third effects are of of taking those options and not taking those options, um, and and I think the key bit is when when the contract really isn't for me, I try and introduce them to someone who I think is the right fit for them and can give them the service they want. And I think if you do that, um, you know, suddenly that person appreciates what you've done. Um, and if they ever do need your services, they'll, they'll come back to you. And I think that sort of honesty in business is is, is the, the best thing, which, you know, and, and I think we've also stuck in our swim lane. So instead of trying to be the answer to everyone's, you know, a one-stop shop for everyone's security um, requirements, we do close protection uh, and we do it to the best of our ability. We do some surveillance and we do... Um, you know some other bits and pieces, but you know that is our that's our core effort, and I think that's what we've become known for. And I think you know that that's the best thing to do. You know, if not you know if I ever get asked for advice, I, I always tell people you know do something you know do something you you know if you love it that's even better, but but stick to what you know. And you know cyber security is my one. I always say when people say to me. Um, do you do cyber security? I always turn and say no. And if you can find someone who, who can describe cyber security to you, can you ask them to come and talk to me? Because I have not got a clue what it is or what they do. Um, so, yeah, that's what we've done. We, we, we just try and keep it as pure as we can. And when you, when you talk about um, just doing the basics really well, within, within your world, of close protection and, and, and the event security that you, that you, that I've worked with you on, certainly with the NFL and, and other things. What are those basics? What are the basics that you do well? Well, we right place, right time, right kit and equipment is what I was taught right from the we go. And, and we always do that. Um, we always do the pre and the post briefing and debriefing which is, I think, the, the most important thing. If you go out and you've had a good brief and you've got a good plan and the task will always run well. And then if you debrief it at the end and you find out what the little hiccups were and you feed that back into the next brief and you make sure you cover that, so a bit of lessons identified, then then you're always going to have good tasks. Um, and I think from, from, the, from a client perspective, we are discreet. We provide the services we're good at, like I said before, and I think we're, we're good at being um, transparent about what we're doing and why. 
And I think once you've got those key pieces in place, um, you know, you, you, you can't go far wrong. Yeah, I mean, my experience of working with you is, is exactly that. I mean, I can remember turning up at the crack of dawn to, to do a task and all your people were there looking immaculate, cheerful. What well, They knew what they were there to do. They knew what they were going to do. One person was the person that you interacted with, but everyone else was helpful. And everything went without a hiccup because everyone knew what they had to do. But they all did it with a really good attitude, which I think is a big thing as well. It's, you know, no one felt belittled or, you know, they were part of a team. They looked, they all looked immaculate. It was, it was, and what was clear was they had been briefed. They all knew what they were there for. And that does make a huge difference, particularly when you're um, part of or, or a, an element of that whole project or in fact you might be kind of leading that project. It just, it's just one less thing to worry about. You just know that part of it is dealt with. I don't need to even think about that. It's going to be in hand. That makes a big difference. Yeah, exactly. And I think part of that, that attitude, that, that, um, that positive attitude that we, we instill in all our, um, guys and girls that come work for us is, is from that. I, you know, we, we do try and treat them as well as, as we possibly can. And that's not just about, you know, money. That's important. Everyone wants to get paid well. But, you know, we always, you know, can try and consider their work environment and make it the most, you know, pleasant place it can be. Um, because then, you know, we get that reaction that you just um, vocalised for us then, which is, you know, they turn up, they're enthusiastic, they're motivated, the client is happy. Um, it, it improves every, you know, the client's day. No one wants to be around people who, you know, look like they've, They've just worked for 36 hours and they've got no motivation left in their body. And I think, you know, that that's the the key thing is, you know, well motivated people who who we who, you know, they know that at any stage that they can speak to me and tell me that there's an issue and you know, I'm not gonna palm it off. I'm gonna listen to what they say. Um, because it's all about making the service as, as good as it can for the client. And Operating in a, in, a, in a close protection environment in the UK, where nobody's armed or no one, you know, no one's carrying any any weapons that's going to assist them in in defending or or, or 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 protecting those people, you know, that's one challenge. What are the challenges of operating in the UK as a close protection team or as a close protection operative? Um. So I think. The biggest challenges for for us in close protection are um, it's the classic you know pe- people who need protection don't want it, and the people who don't need protection do want it, and and it's about being able to understand that or have the discussion with the client about need and want, and and getting them to understand the threat, and I know that's how effectively we've been drawn together because we've been working on on how you can have a process where you know the client importantly understands their needs for security as opposed to you know just their own opinion about whether they, what they want so that that I, I think is a challenge because actually for people who want security and don't need it if if you're you know um probably not as ethically driven as, as me and you, you know, we can supply people and you can have it all day long and that's fine. It's for the people where there is an absolute need and then they're not willing to commit to the, the level of resource that is required to absolutely keep them safe. So from a professional point of view, that piece I've always struggled with. Um, commercially, you know, in, in when I was in the, the military, a bit like when you were in the police, uh, because there was no financial tag attached to any of it when we decided it was gold standard effectively the, the principle was taken out of the equation and right you're going to need this this and this and obviously commercially you just can't do that um because there is a price tag that someone along the line's got to pick up so so weaving in and out of that um of that needs and wants i, I find um you know a, a a complex part of 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 the job, and as a CP operator, I think that's the 
from a planning and, st- and strategic sort of relationship point of view with a client, that, that could be the hardest one to navigate. Mm. Um, from a tactical point of view on the ground, I think the biggest thing that I, you know, that from a tactics point of view and what a lot of the, the guys and girls do, what they learn on their CP courses, um, you know, there are different stand. There is a different level of standards out there and knowledge, but a lot of them do a really, really good job. And and I think the good thing about the SIA is it does provide a baseline of of training. You know, and I know there's a few issues around training at the moment with the SIA, but you know it does provide the baseline to get people in there. I think where we need to go now is I think is understanding your rights within the law. I think. There should be more emphasis on that within close protection training so that people understand what they can and cannot do and what the law says they can and cannot do. Because actually the UK law system is really robust. Mm. And as private security individuals, mm. there's, there's quite a lot of, um, you know, area where, where you can work in, you know, the understanding of private land. And again, you know, I know we've worked through this over the last couple of years about, you know, pro- it, it might feel like it's public property, but actually it's all private property. And once you might have a ticket there, which gives you access, but once that uh, access is revoked, it's private property and you can be removed and you can be removed using f- the amount of force that's deemed requires. And I think sometimes we get wrapped around um, the, the the legality of it because we don't understand the law. Mm. So I think from a CP point of view, I think there needs to be more emphasis on that. Mm. And also, and then I think the, the UK sector, I think, you know, as business owners in the, in the, in the sector, we should all be pushing um, for a greater acceptance from our, our clients that, that, you know, security is here. It's here to stay. It's a fundamental part of of the business cycle now and you know it it needs to be budgeted and accommodated for and and then we need to ensure that the people that are working for us are are being paid at the appropriate rate for their time their expertise and their professionalism and that's in, incumbent on all of us uh not not just it not just the the SIA in fact I think it's more about business leaders taking the bit between their teeth and pushing that on because um, we all understand the value of our people, and, and uh, I think it's you know the, the phrase "race to the bottom" is used quite a lot in security, but it's only used because as business leaders we allow it. Mm. Um, and and actually, there's got to be a point now where we turn around and say, "No, um, you know these people work hard for you. They work long hours. They do a fantastic job. Um, you know." And, that there are there is a correct level of remuneration for them mm. Mm. so uh yeah I, uh, hopefully that asked the question without going on for too long yeah no i mean it, it is it is a fascinating part of the industry and i think you know you're there, you're right there is that that element that is that that side of it where there are people doing it for for very low rates and and frankly they don't necessarily follow the same values and principles that you might do in terms of briefing we all know the kind of whatsapp groups and what have you that people are kind of just bums on seats. Um, but I think, you know, that's a very different level to that which you're operating at and which, you know, if somebody wants the standard that Minerva produced, they're not going to go down that route. So, it's it, you know, I think, um, you know, you kind of know what you're going to get when you when you go for someone like Minerva. Um, so, so where do you see, I mean, where do you see the industry going then in the next, say, five, ten years? Um. Well, I, I don't. I don't see our our security threat diminishing in the next eight to ten years. You know, unfortunately for all of us, I don't think the world is becoming a safer place, and I think people are becoming more educated and more knowledgeable on the fact that, that of the threats that are out there. Um, and if anything, you know, I think we're seeing. Um, especially with some of the work you do that, um, you know, social media, the, the fact that, you know, these these devices that we carry now can give us almost a global reach in a nanosecond means that, um, you know, people are ultimately less, you know, less safe. Their, their data is now available to the wrong people. There's nefarious activity that can happen on social media. These are all, you know, 
it doesn't take an expert to work any of this stuff out. Um, so I, I think security is going to become to the forefront. And then from a UK sector perspective, um, I, I know there's a lot still to work through with UK protect and, and the protect duty. But, you know, I, th- I think that is coming down the line towards us. And, and there's going to be a greater responsibility on security company business owners and leaders and and operatives within the private security sector within the UK or, or, uh, to take responsibility for their for their action. So professionalisation is is going to be increased. I'm not saying we're not professional now. That's that's the last thing I'd, I'd say. We are, you know, as a sector, I think, you know, there's some fantastic professionals out there. But I think we're going to be fo- we're going to be yeah, forced into taking more responsibility. I think the term they're using at the moment is the, the competent individual. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of legislation around the corner, which, you know, I'm not comparing it to health and safety legislation, but I think it's going to be along those lines where, you know, suddenly security will not be will not be ignored anymore uh, or won't be allowed to be ignored by all the people we provide security for. So I think, I think that's... Uh, uh, an opportunity for the sector and i think you know we we just got to approach it with that sort of open mind um that you know the professionalism we've shown up to this point we, we now need it will now push to the next level and it will be you know that responsibility will be put on us um to, to keep these events safe in the, or you know in everyday life safe um which is the the business we're in and, and if a client recruits minerva What's the sort of process they'll go through? What will they experience when, you know, I come to you and I say, you know, I need protection, I need some security for my family, et cetera, or for, for you know, an event we're going to. What what typically does that process look like when you when you employ Minerva? So the first steps that I think are obviously the initial um contact with the client and and you know the overview of the company and, and what we think we're good at and, and and what we you know what we provide expertise in and then really it's very much straight into that sort of consultation piece where the client's needs or wants are assessed um so we can give you know, honest feedback about, you know, you think you need this, but why do you need this? You know, wh- why, what is the record, you know, what is the factor that's driving you to believe you need this? And and, and I think sometimes that that, that conversation is, is the best conversation because you can really get under the skin of the client and say, you know, work out what, you know, what, what is the real driver for this? Because, you know, is it vanity it, or or is it the fact that, you know, you have got a serious threat uh, in, in coming against you? Um, and we don't um, we don't profess to be experts at that. So, you know, what, if it's a blatant, straightforward threat that we can analyse, then, you know, we will go with it and we'll move to the next step, which is, you know, a considered plan and, and a almost like a... a yeah, considered plan of of what we think the correct security profile looks like, and then ensuring that the profile suits the client. And I, you know, that's hugely important. Right? You've got to have the right security individual with the client, and there's got to be an element of gel in there. But going back to that first that consultation phase, but it, that for me there is when I can't work out what their driver is. It's about pulling the correct sort of intelligence picture in and the correct intelligence individuals to to sit with a client and, and understand that so we can really unpick it because in the long term, the longer, you know, you have people, you know, there, there's a cost to, to every part of the security process that I'm going to put in place where actually if the intelligence picture doesn't fit that, you're spending a lot of money, which is then wasted. So think, you know, we're definitely now, every client contact we have, it's about that that initial considerations, you know, why are you doing this? 
you know, pull in a, an expert as required to make sure that you know if if we're not happy with him with the answer that you know there is a threat there um and then building that that plan that security plan around them and then ensuring that the the fit is right in terms of the individuals and the people before we then um move to sort of intermediate operating capability which is obviously the start of the, the security introduction and then we will do a review and then FOC, so full op- operating capability, somewhere down the road um, is the last phase, you know, which is where we would see the whole situation security plan up and running and uh, and the client as, you know, comfortable with what's happening. I won't ever say they're happy with the security plan because, but I think that's the key bit. They should feel that the security plan has been incorporated around them and it's only affected their lives at the absolute points of um, where the, where there can't be any debate about it. And and I think you know what makes a a great um, you know someone who's good at security to someone who's great at, at security is about that compromise piece. It's about being able to talk with the client about things that they want to do, and not saying no, but how do we do this? What's the compromise where we're still keeping you safe and you're still a bit doing what you want to do and that could be you know very small things or it could be you know huge changes but i think that's what i look for in ppos is that is that uh or personal protection officers is that ability to be able to, to compromise but you know and, and keep the security um bubble tight yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating one, isn't it? I and mean, I remember, you know, doing various bits and pieces for members of the royal family, and you know, the answer was they're never going to cancel. So you've got to work out a way to achieve this that's going to keep them safe um, because they're not cancelling. So you, it's so it's, it, it requires you to be flexible, not them. Um, and you know, the idea that you can impose security on someone is is a bit of a myth. Yeah, no, I agreed absolutely. It's, um, you know, I, and I think in the commercial world, it's it's probably exactly the same. You know, I, I don't think you could have that conversation with a client. It's this is what we're doing today, and and you work it, you work a plan around me, which is is good because I think you know no two days are ever the same. Mm. Um, and you know, if you want to be in a a job where you're having to problem solve, you know. For, for most of your shift, then uh, there's nothing better than private security, I don't think. Mm. And, 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 and the, go on. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, I think it, it, it's interesting that um, uh, private security draws in quite a few retired soldiers, airmen, sailors, um, Royal Marines, former police officers, because I think it, it, it appeals to our problem solving brains you know we we tend to be practical people and and i think you know it, it appeals to us because you're you're constantly having having to use your wits and 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 you use your brain to sort out you know complex problems ar- around you on a daily basis but it's interesting isn't it because i don't think that's the perception is it that's not how people from the military or the police or in other environments they're not necessarily seen as problem solvers. They're seen as kind of you know, regimented and, and and disciplined and all that. And, and people probably don't see security as a problem solving process. They see it as something that is a um, you know a regime or a, or, or a thing that is that is there to stop bad things or what have you. But but actually, you're right. And now I think it's a really interesting perspective. Is this is about solving problems, and it's we're going to do this in a way that helps keep you safe. Absolutely, and and you know I, I know a number of PPOs who who end up giving advice to their um, to their principals, um, you know, or, or being asked their opinion about certain things that that are, that are going on in a principal's life because they want a a different view. And once they've got to know you, they're like, yeah, all right, yeah. What do you think of that? Um, and you know, they get an honest answer. And um, you know, I, I did a a job when I was in the military and I was with quite a um, high ranking politician and, and he would, he would ask me on quite a regular case, you know, what do you think of that guy? And and he was genuinely interested in, in, 
in the situ in what I thought of the situation that we were in, and um, you know, I mean, fantastic for me because I felt valued and 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 you know part of the team, but also you know really interesting to see the way that he he then used that information um, as part of his wider. You know, he, he was pulling information in from all over the place, and it made up part of his his strategy for when he moved forward. And uh, and I think that's you know PPOs. You know, there there is a lot of there's a lot of um, interactions with the client or the principal that aren't given the the airtime or people just don't realise, you know, you become an integral part of their, of their close team uh, of their, in, I think the classic thing is their inner circle. Mm. Um, and, and that's a fantastic job, you know, and it's a fan, it's a fantastic privilege to be part of it mm. um, and, and see some of the things you see. Mm. Um, and, uh, but ultimately as well, uh, there are, there are long periods of, um, of boredom and, and sitting waiting for the, for the client to move. So I think, you know, it's not Kevin Costner and the bodyguard, but it's also um, not, not the dr- the dreariest job either. It's, um, you know, I think there are a lot of very appealing things about being in the, it being in private security. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of appealing things about being in close protect, the close protection side of it. Um, you know, and, and that problem solving ability, I think is, is a key to it. So we're, we're drawing to the end of the of the of the, uh, of the podcast, and I'm I'm conf- you know conscious of the time and grateful for the time you've given. If if people you know what what else, I mean I know Minerva does other things. It does training. So you know if, what sort of courses do you run? How if someone wants training, what sort of things would they come to you for? So um, Minerva was born really out of my um, my experiences when I when I left the military and. Not, you know, my personal experience when I left the military when I when I when I entered higher education, um, actually I was quite a big fish in a small pond. I was super confident at my job, but when you asked me to write a, uh, an essay and and submit it to someone I didn't know for marking, you know, my, my confidence suddenly um, withdrew, and I was actually, you know, pretty unconfident um, about my ability to do that now, and I was. I got through it, and thankfully, in the in the second part of the process, when I was at university, I was I was really heavily supported, um, or really well supported by the university and and the professor that was running the, the program. And I just thought there's a gap here um, when people transitioning out of the military. Not only do I think that it's pretty stale in terms of what the military offers. Um, and it's very much like health and safety or, or at the time I was offered health and safety project management, um, not stuff that was really setting, setting the world on fire for me. Um, and I looked at some of the sort of more business qualifications and just thought, you know, this is what, this is what entrepreneurial problem solving people need. They need more stuff like this and less stuff, which is sort of pegging them into health and safety. Um, and they need a company, I think, that will support them on their educational journey. So that, that's what we started. And we started doing business qualifications. Um, and, we, and we still do that as a core part. But actually now, having moved into the security sector, we are doing stuff along the lines of first aid, CP top-ups. Um, we're about to run our first surveillance course, which we're, we're all pretty excited about. Um, we do teacher training so you know again what we thought were, were people coming out of the military coming out of the police all fantastic people people most of them are good at public speaking um generally have had have if they if they've not been trainers they've been trained so they understand it so we run those trainer qualifications now um so yeah all, all that sort of stuff all geared around really um people who are probably retiring from a service career of one of the, you know, of any of the services uh, and are going to go into a second career and need some qualifications. So that's the sort of stuff we do. Um, and, we, you know, give advice as well. You know, we're a company of former, um, 
all military or all armed forces. Um, so we know what it's like to transition, and, and I don't think it actually matters what, what you're transitioning from. If I'm honest, um, the hurdles and the problems are the same, uh, and and I you know sometimes even here it's just a chat about whew, feeling a bit lonely now. You know, I've not got the camera guard you had when I was in the job or I was in the army. Um, you know, it's nice to be able to speak to someone and say, well, that's what, that's what it was like for me. This is what I did to try and make it better. Or, you know, it doesn't last forever. You know, you, you move on and you, you can be just as rewarded and just as fulfilled as you were when you were in your previous career. Brilliant. So what we'll do is we will, um, in, in the notes of this, obviously attach all the various uh, domain, you know, website contacts for 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 um, Minerva Elite in terms of the the um, the protection side and also the educational side because I think you know I I, I mean I you know I think when I left the, the the military and and to a lesser degree the police you know I'd have I'd have absolutely loved to have had that that support and that op- those opportunities in terms of education because you know. People aren't people who join the military or the police or the fire service or whatever else. You know, th- th- they may not be academically um, gifted because because the choices they made at very young ages, but they've got a huge amount to offer. And sometimes they just need that leg up and a bit of support and a bit of, as you say, I, I know I was exactly the same. I did a master's degree, probably similar time to you, and I can remember my wife coming up to me on the first after the first day of me studying and I, I she said how's it going and I said I'm still on the first page because I had to learn about 50 different words I'd never heard of before um and and it you know it, it, it's it's not necessarily where our talents lie but it was a, one of the best things I ever did was to study and um you know I think uh, I, I know that yourself and Sean and others have talked quite a lot about it so I'd recommend people if that's what you're thinking about doing or you're even it's on the you know sort of on your um horizon definitely contact a guy and his team because they do a fantastic job of of really equipping you to to take that next step in your career, or even just doing it for your own personal development. Um, so we'll we'll attach all those details. Guy, I'm conscious that you've given me um, a lot of your time tonight, and I'm I'm um, as always uh, hugely grateful. It's always always a good experience chatting to you um, because, despite the fact you were the Royal Engineers, you're you know eloquent and and uh, have a degree of intelligence, which is always baffling. Um, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that for all the sappers out there. But anyway, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. It's been it's been a real, um, it's been a really good conversation around some really I think hope interesting topics. Um, and I think it, it's so fascinating hearing how someone who's operated at the very tip of the spear for you know a long period of time in probably the most active period since the second world war um and and the skills and the mentality and the values that you brought from that into into the commercial world with minerva um and 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 that transition and how impactful that has i've seen it for myself if anyone's in any doubt they need to give you a call um but um thank you for your time uh it's been great speaking with you and um i think i'm seeing you next week anyway so i look forward to that That's great, Philip. Thanks very much. Lovely to speak to you. All right. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Diffuse podcast with host Philip Rendell, CEO and founder of Diffuse. Please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.